So hi, everyone, again. Uh, this is going to be the second part, indeed. This is going to be about the why. So why would you want to be Bayesian? And what are the different ways to be Bayesian? So I'm, I'm definitely not an expert of what I'm going to tell you. This is just the opinion of someone who's been interested in this and I've been reading about this. But again, this is not my research, so you should take what I say with a pinch of salt. It's just the, what, what I think about it after having read quite a, quite a lot of material. But this is, uh, this is what we're going to discuss. So the different reasons for being a Bayesian that I want to highlight today are the following. You could be a Bayesian because you abide by what's called the likelihood principle. We'll see what this means. You could be a Bayesian because you place coherence about over, uh, like above all things. You want to be a coherent decision maker, and I'm going to tell you what it means to be coherent. And if you do this, you're called a subjectivist. You're called a subjective Bayesian. Okay? Now, if you want to put a little less emphasis on coherence and a little more emphasis on uh, creating consensus, for example, because you're working with a large team of physicists and biologists, scientists, and you want to claim to some objectivity of a discovery, then you might want to be an objective Bayesian. You want, want to be, might want to be an objectivist. You might just be a frequent, you might just be a Bayesian because you want to be a good frequentist. That's also a valid reason to be a Bayesian, uh, at least if you're a Valdian frequentist. Uh, we've seen uh, there were posters about this yesterday. Um, and I will finish by, uh, by uh, just giving you a hint of what I think is the, the viewpoint that's dominating in recent textbooks. It's a hybrid viewpoint that's taking a little bit of all uh, these first points. But it has to take this little bit, again, with a pinch of salt, because as we'll see, these four first viewpoints are not compatible with each other. So if you choose one of them, it gives you degrees of freedom on how you can choose your prior, for example, and uh, how you can choose your likelihood, how you can choose your update mechanism, Bayes theorem. And uh, you might not get these degrees of freedom if you want to abide by one of the other principles. So you kind of need, I think, to understand what kind of Bayesian you want to be if you want to be able to answer the question, OK, am I, am I allowed to do this with my prior? And this is, this is the, I mean, one of the biggest questions that the students have. So this is, this is all part of a course that we are giving with Julien Arbel. And then one of the big questions is, is always like, what, can I take my prior to do this? Can I, can I do this with my prior? Can I use data to tune my prior? Can I, you, can I use the model, the likelihood, to tune my prior? Well, this, all these, uh, these answers that, I, that you can give are not absolute. They actually depend on which of the, the first four items here you want to use as your justification for being Bayesian. OK, so just a recap. We've seen the posterior expected loss uh, principle. That was the second, uh, the second box. It's just a corollary of the first box if you want to choose, uh, if you want to choose uh, your actions conditional and S0, because my actions, remember, were labeled by a G. My G was either a predictor or a, or a credible interval or anything that actually depended only on data. And I used to choose these actions using a decision rule delta. OK, so let's see the first item. I want to abide by the likelihood principle. OK? The likelihood principle, the best source of information that, that you can find is the monograph by uh, Berger and Volpert, 1988. And they have a whole monograph in defense of this likelihood principle. So they define the formal, and this is the most formal that they get, and that's one of the issues. Uh, likelihood principle as follows. So consider two statistical experiments, and they call a statistical experiment uh, a triplet uh, E, so, such as this uh, E1 and E2. So E1 is a random variable x1. There's a parameter of inference. There's a parameter of interest theta. It has to be the same in the two experiments, and they assume that xi actually follows one of the laws in the family of laws that I'm giving you after afterwards. Uh, for the value of theta in pink. So there's kind of a well specification built in the definition of their statistical experiment. So they have a family of parameterized models, and they have two statistical experiments about the same parameter theta. 
Now, assume that there, is a, there are realizations x1 and x2. Uh, such that uh, the um, P1 of X1 as a function of theta. Okay, so you, I give you a realization X1 of the first random variable, and you look at the likelihood as a function of theta. That's the likelihood. So P of X1, the likelihood, uh, but for fixed X1, is proportional to the likelihood of the second experiment. So again, fixed X2 considered as a function of theta. Okay. Now, if your likelihoods are proportional, the Berger and Volpert say that if you denote the evidence on theta arising from the experiment E and data X as F of E X, if you denote this, this thing by F, okay, the evidence, whatever is the evidence on theta that you can get from a from a datum in an experiment, then the evidence that you get in the first experiment using the first data, data, data set, is the same as the evidence you get from the second experiment using the second data set. Okay? And as a corollary, this notion of evidence can depend on x only through the likelihood function, through p of x as a p of x dot as a function of theta. Okay? And, and one of the issues is that this is as formal as it gets. Uh, so uh, we were discussing this, mor this, this morning. Um, one of the, if you read the book by Berger and Volpert, it has a discussion section afterwards. It's uh, in, this, in, the, in the like of uh, GRSSB articles. So, and you have all these famous names discussing the book. And the first discussion, I think, is by Le Cam. And his first bullet is, okay, but I don't understand what this function is, f of, f of ex. I don't even know if it exists. I don't know where it's defined. I know what's the range of that function. Uh, how, say, in all of these books about foundations, there's a part of it which is described in words. And it's always the part of which actually uh, people feel uncomfortable about, and that's the part of which that uh, makes the that makes the point i think uh, hard to uh, to um, that makes it hard to convince people but anyway let's let's assume there's such a function as this evidence and uh, that it's uh, it only depends on the likelihood now standard bayes satisfies this likelihood principle right imagine you have uh, so two models p1 of x1 theta and p2 of x2 theta so with two datum and you add the same prior, that's my first bullet, you add the same prior, P of theta in pink. Now, uh, both of them, so the product of the likelihood and the prior, they're both proportional to their own posteriors, P of i of theta given xi, and they have the same z, just because the likelihoods are equal and the priors are equal, and we're considering them for fixed xi. Okay, so the, the normalization constant is the same. Now, if you take an action, remember an action is a function from the set of states to a set of rewards or prizes, and you compute the average cost of that, uh, of that action on the left according to the first model, and on the right according to the second model, you'll see that the two are proportional just because by construction we satisfy the likelihood principle. And so base actions will actually coincide. Okay, so we're quite, it's built in standard base that it satisfies the likelihood principle. There's other ways to satisfy the likelihood principle. If you're doing inference and you're doing maximum likelihood, you're satisfying the likelihood principle. Okay, so it doesn't constrain the ways to do statistics to only base. What I want to insist on is that if you look at full expected utilities, so if you also look at the, remember when I showed you posterior expected loss, I had actually used the towering property of the expectation. I had decomposed my expectation in a, an expectation over observed values, and then an expectation over unobserved values given observed values. So now if I reintroduce this first expectation on observed values to look at the full expected utility of my action, now the, the X1s come in again. And now I have to integrate over all x1s on the left and on the right, and there's no reason these two integrals are the same. Okay, I've only asked that they were proportional for a fixed x1 and a fixed x2. Now if I'm integrating over all possible data sets, there's no reason that these two things are the same. 
So the two actions might not have the same expected utility in the two models, but the two base actions coincide. Okay? But so by, by design, standard base satisfies this. Yeah? Yeah. So you can come up with examples with proportional by just adding a stopping time, for example. So you add a stopping time that's only a function of the data. You sample data, I flip a coin until I have reached 10 heads. And that's the same. And look at the likelihood for the same number, but a fixed number this time of flips. The two likelihoods are proportional but the two models are different. And there's gonna be an indicator that depends only on the data. If you try to come up with any frequentist measure of, I don't know, a p-value or anything that integrates over the x's, you'll come up with very different values in the two experiments because of this expectation over data. But if you look at the likelihoods, they are exactly proportional. And the proportionality constant depends on the data only, but to, for your base action, it's a, it doesn't matter. So if you were uh, peeping through a hole and you look at someone who is, uh, you're peeping through the keyhole and you look at someone who is flipping coins inside the room and he stops flipping his coin, he, he might have some stopping rule in his head. He might have stopped because he's reached, I don't know, 10 heads or because his P hat is larger than 0.9. But the inference he's doing on the bias of the coin and yours are supposed to be the same in this negative binomial experiment or in the Bernoulli experiment, you'll see you, you have proportional likelihood. That's the, that's the basic example. Actually, I'm gonna come back on that example on the second slide because this, there's one aspect of this uh, likelihood principle that forces you to be insensitive to uh, um, to, uh, to a couple of things that only depend on the data, and for example, to stopping rules. So let's look at the following experiment. So my state space is gonna be um, the union of n times, I'm collecting data, I'm collecting n points, and let's say I'm collecting at least one, and then I have a theta. And I'm trying to make inference on theta using data that I collect as follows. So you imagine my P over my state is defined as follows. I consider the marginal of theta to be P of theta. And I consider data to be drawn as follows. Y1, et cetera, are drawn I ID from some likelihood P given theta until the first time that uh, Y one N belongs to some accept rejection region R N or to some region R N. Okay, so there's a I collect data until something happens to my data uh, until something happens to my data. I flip a coin until I have enough heads. Okay. So let's see, this is the way I collect data. Now my state space, I'm, I have to take it to be a union over Y's of different sizes because I don't know in advance the size of my Y and I wanna put a measure on this big union. Okay, and I'm, I'm telling you just the, the measure by uh, giving, you the, okay, giving you a sampling procedure. Now what happens if I look at the expected cost of an action? Let's say that I want to estimate theta. Now, this expectation, I'm just gonna decompose it on the set of events where I'm gonna call capital N the random variable, which is the number of data points that I, that I sample. I'm just gonna decompose the, this expectation over the different values of N. 
And uh, by monotone convergence, I'm going to take the, the sum out. And I'm going to write this. Uh, and maybe I'm going to write, yeah, no, I'm going to write it on the next line. So this thing here is the indicator of n equals n. So it's the, the indicator of a it's the indicator that y one n is in R n and the product of the indicator for L smaller than n that the previous time the previous uh, first L points did not satisfy the condition, right? And then I have my likelihood. Oh, I forgot my loss function. I should is it somewhere? Let's say I want to perform inference and I have a squared loss. And then my likelihood is here. My P of theta is here. D theta, D Y one N. Okay. And so what does a, what does a decision rule look on this, uh, on this uh, big state space? My, my um, decision rule will be a sequence of decision rules. I need to have one decision rule for each size of my data set. But look, it's uh, quite obvious which decision rule I should take because this here is exactly the type of integrals that we've been studying since the beginning. It's just, we are just back at plain old base for fixed n. So the optimal, the base action, if I want to minimize this integral by taking a theta hat n, should change color. If I want a theta hat n, that depends on y one n. If I want theta star, the base, the base action for a fixed size of the data set is just going to be the regular base action. It's just going to be theta base y one n. Because this is just the same kind of integral that we had before. I'm just going to do as always. I'm going to put the data in front. I'm not going to consider it. And then I'm going to put an integral over theta. And this is going to be the integral of theta minus theta hat squared times some distribution proportional to a posterior. And to minimize this, I just take the posterior, expect the posterior expectation. Right? So for each fixed n, I should choose the regular Bayes action, the Bayes action I would have chosen for a fixed n if I didn't care for my, uh, for my stopping rule. And that's a sequence of decision rules that actually minimizes the overall expected loss. So by design, what I should do is for each fixed n, pick the Bayes action as if I had uh, run an experiment with uh, this fixed number of data points. The, uh, oldest, uh, the terms that depend on the stopping rule, they're just dependent on data. They're just going to go in the outer expectation in my expected utility, the expectation over S observed. Okay? So by design, a Bayesian is invariant to, is insensitive to stopping rules. Stopping rules, as long as they depend only on data, do not modify my behavior as a statistician when it comes to inference. Of course, it modifies the overall expected utility of my base rule, because to compute this, I need to in integrate over data. But my behavior, the fact that I will go back to my biologist and give him my, my posterior expected, my, uh, my posterior mean, this doesn't change. The value of this action in, in when integrated over data does change. Was that clear? All right. So now, this likelihood principle is, uh, is considered compelling to many. And, and it's considered absolutely to be compelling by, by my idol, Leonard Savage. He says, like, basically, I don't, he, he said he didn't like it at first. He, at first, he thought it was a scandal. And then over the course of his career, he shifted from scandal to I don't see 
how anyone could do anything else ever. So I, I really tried to, to, to adhere, but somehow it still makes me tick. So for, for starters, it doesn't lead all the way to Bayes, right? The likelihood principle, the being Bayesian is not the only way to satisfy the likelihood principle. And there's no, I don't see how you could further constrain the, the LP to fall down onto base. Doing max, maximum likelihood is a good way to abide by the likelihood principle if you're doing inference. So it's in this sense, I don't think it's uh, restricted enough, restrictive enough as a foundation. Then I'm still uncomfortable with the stopping rule principle. The fact that I'm doing the same inference as someone who is in a room and knows the stopping rule about the flips of my coin, it's, I don't know, it's supposed to be obvious that we should do the same inference and it's still not to me. It's probably because there's, there's still a bit of frequentist in me and I, I feel uncomfortable about the fact of not knowing about this stopping rule. I mean, imagine the stopping rule. You're sampling a Gaussian and you're sampling a Gaussian, this is a famous example discussed in the book, you're sampling a Gaussian until the um, Gaussian of mean zero and you're sampling it until mu hat is larger than 10. This is bound to happen. It's gonna take a long time, but it's bound to happen. And then you stop. And I'm supposed to do the same, in, I'm supposed to take my posterior mean and, and act as if I didn't care about the stopping rule, but that's, that's really extreme. And of course, it's, uh, it's, it seems extreme to me just because I, I am thinking in terms of frequentist risk of my procedure, and I should not, but, uh, but still. I'm not sure you can, you can forget that much about the, the, the frequentist risk, but I, I don't know how to really formulate this, but this is, this is one example that has made people really uneasy. Um, it also requires you to specify your likelihood. Sometimes you don't want. I think the talk that comes right behind me is uh, generalized likelihood in the sense of eta Bayes in the sense of Bissier and Walker. So you'll see examples of people who don't want to specify a likelihood. So by definition, who don't want to abide by the likelihood principle. So it prevents model-free, what's called model-free Bayes. Uh, it separates the roles of the likelihood and the prior, and, and sometimes this is not, such, not, so, not so clear cut. We were discussing this yesterday as well. There's examples where it's not that clear which one, which one should go where. Plus, by definition, I mean, for LP abiding Bayesians, the, your prior is definitely not allowed to depend on the data. Otherwise, my whole argument on the stopping rule invariance falls, right? If your prior depends on data, then you have to keep this bigger indicator in your integral. So if you're, if you're making your prior depend on data, if you're an empirical Bayesian, you're definitely not a likelihood principle Bayesian. So you're not a Berger and Volpert. And you cannot claim to be invariant to stopping rules. And this is apparently a big thing in, in psychology where they like to use uh, objective priors. We'll see Jeffrey's prior. Jeffrey's prior violates the likelihood principle, so it doesn't uh, make you immune to stopping rules, and stopping rules are important in some experiments in psychology, so there's big disputes around this. One, one thing that as a machine learner I'm happy with, with this stopping rule principle, is that it's kind of giving me a license to go online and download the data set, which, which I think is, is, uh, is, is something that I hadn't thought about before. If you go on Kaggle or you go on, on UCI and you download the data set and you try your favorite method on this data set, you, of course you weren't there during the collection of the data. You don't know whether the biologist who observed these whales actually stopped observing because he ran out of gas or because he had seen enough white whales. You have no idea about his stopping rule, but it doesn't prevent you from being able to do inference on this data as a Bayesian. If you wanted to do non-likelihood, uh, if you didn't abide by the likelihood principle, then you'd be actually philosophically in trouble if trying to make inference if you don't have all the information about the collection of the data. So it's kind of a license to go and now download data sets. This I like. Okay, now that's, uh, here comes my favorite, but also the ones that make, makes me the most frustrated, subjective base. So because you place coherence above all things. Any questions about the likelihood principle? Okay, so 
have been accused to show only uh, old white males. So this, those are the last two promised. Uh, yes, I think so. Um, so the top requirement is internal coherence of decisions. And uh, two uh, big names here are, I, I gave the names. It's, uh, it's not good. So on the left, you have Definetti. And on the right, you have Savage. So Definetti, Italian statistician, and, and uh, Savage uh, was American. Um, so they both are, are big names in this, uh, in this line of research about trying to come up with a way to lead all the way to expected utility from some general principle that can be interpreted as being an internally coherent decision maker. So let's, uh, let's look at bits of Savage's, Savage's idea. So Savage, again, starts from the vault uh, framework for a decision problem under, under uncertainty, which, which we've covered yesterday. So there's a state space S, there's a um, reward space Z, there's an action space A, and the action space is a subset of the functions that go from the states to, uh, to the Z, to the rewards. And the idea of Savage is to uh, list what we expect from a binary relation on, on A. Okay, so you have a binary relation between actions. You have, as, a, as a decision maker, you are forced to make choices between actions. And I will observe how you make choices between actions and uh, I will uh, try to uh, understand the way you make choices and we'll see that if you satisfy enough good properties about your preference relation, about this uh, binary relation between, between actions, then you necessarily are using somehow an expected utility in the background. So, axioms. I think the first axiom that, that Savage puts is that uh, this preference relation is transitive, meaning that uh, if, you have, if you prefer B to A and you prefer C to B, then you prefer C to, to A, uh, and he wants it to be complete. Actually, I think that in his book, uh, it's, it's not easy because the Savage's book where he explains like uh, this, this whole theorem is, is full of text. And it's not always easy to uh, separate the, to actually write the assumptions in, in mathematical form. But I think he assumes that A is actually all functions from F, from S to Z. You can go away with a subset, but you'll need at least to have all constant functions. Um, da, da, da. It's complete. Uh, so I was telling you about constant functions. So a constant function is a function that assigns the same reward z to any state. And we call, by, we denote these functions by z. So if, if you assign the value z to any state s, I will call this uh, constant function by z. So there exist z1 and z2 in the set of rewards such that you prefer Z, Z2 over Z1. Okay, so there, are, there exist two constant actions and you prefer one to the other. But again, all constant actions need to be in the set A for, for, for Savage. R in A. Um, the third axiom, and the last one I want to talk about, but it's going to be the longest one, is the, what's called the sure thing principle. And it's arguably the central axiom to uh, Savage's framework. The sure thing principle says the following, so I'm going to state it abstractly and we're going to discuss what it means. Um, so I'm going to take four actions, A, B, G, H. Uh, and I have to give a definition. I am going to take uh, so let me give you the definition first, otherwise it's 
going to be completely unintelligible. So small definition, if you take two actions and the subset of the states, then what I call ATB is an action. And it's the action that is A on T and that is B on the complement of T. Okay, so I take, uh, I take action A and I replace it by another action on another subset of the states. Okay, the, and I want this action to be in A. So I will actually insist here on taking A being equal to all functions because otherwise I would need to make sure that this is in, uh, this is my, this is in my action set. So let's take all functions from S to Z to make sure that all manipulations on actions are actually allowed. Okay, do you picture what this action is doing? It's doing the same thing as A on T, but on the rest of T, I don't care, and I'm gonna assign it to another value, the value of another function. Now the, action, the axiom goes as follows. Let four actions in the T. Then if you prefer B to A, when I both replace them on the complement of T by uh, G, you should also prefer B to A when I replace them by something else and vice versa. It's completely equivalent to prefer A to B if you prefer A to B and I change them by where they, are con where they are equal, I set them to another value, you shouldn't change your decision. Let me uh, make a small drawing to explain this axiom. So there's T, there's T complement, and you have A and you have B. And I continue, continue them by whether I continue them on the complement of T by uh, H or by G should not change your preference between A and B. Your preference between A and B should only depend on the values they take wherever they are not equal. Okay? This is the axiom that allows you to define conditional preference. So definition, a is prefer, uh, B is preferred to A conditional on T if, I'm writing an infinite only if, but it's actually a definition. Um, uh, if what? If, uh, If I prefer A to B, whatever I replace them by, if I replace them by any, uh, any constant function, for example. Actually, I think there'd be another way of saying this. Yeah, it should be okay. Or you can replace them by any other function. I mean, because of the axiom, it doesn't depend. Okay. So now comes the. So now we have this. Uh, we have this conditional preference. And if you add, so there's four more axioms that are quite technical, and then there's gonna be structural axioms about S as well. But if you add enough axioms, um, uh, uh, 
the, your preference relation satisfies axioms. They're called P postulates in, in Savage, P1 to P7, if and only if uh, there exists a bounded function U, uh, U goes from the rewards to R plus. It's going to be your utility. Oops. And a finitely additive probability probability measure pi such that you prefer A to B if and only if the integral over pi of u of a s is smaller than the same expectation for b. And that's a theorem by Savage. Uh, the book first edition dates from the 50s. I think it's 54. Not too sure about the date. But that's the, that's the theorem. See. So it calls for comments. First, this is, a, this is really a powerful theorem. I think this, is, this has been described with using really, really big words by decision theorists, like Krebs calls it the crowning glory of, of decision theory. Why is it so powerful? Because it relates this preference among actions. So something that is at least in theory measurable. I could give you pairs of actions and I could ask you to choose one in each of these pairs. And if I gave you enough binary choices to make, I should be able to infer your utility u and your probability measure pi, the one you have in your head, with which you make your decisions, and if you, you, if you abide by the coherence postulates, you're bound to have such a u and a pi in your head, and you're bound to make your decisions using expected utility. So by comparing the utility of action A to the utility of action B, once you integrate them over this pi. This pi is, your, is what people have been calling your subjective beliefs. It's what you use in your head as a probability distribution over the states of the world to make your, to make your decisions. This u is your utility. You can think of it as minus the loss function. We've been using expectations of L of A, S uh, so far because we, I wanted to stick with the vault notation. But you can check that the expectations that we've been using Go back to blue. Uh, think of LAS as minus U of AS. So this is exactly what we've been doing. We've been, we've been uh, choosing our actions, whether it was the credible intervals, whether it was uh, estimators, whether it was prediction and classification. We've been choosing our, our actions by minimizing uh, an expected utility. So what we've been actually doing under the hood is we've, we had this preference relation between actions saying that we preferred the one with the smaller expected utility. Okay, and this, this, this theorem has been, has been interpreted as saying that, for example, that probability lives in the mind. The probability pi here is just a consequence of how, how you behave in front of uncertainty. If you throw a die in front of me, and you ask me to bet on the faces of the die, on the face of the die that will come out, then the fact that I assign probability one six to, to any size, any, any face of the die is an internal propensity to bet on the die. It has nothing to do with any 
probabilistically with any internal property of the die that is probabilistic. It's my behavior in betting on this die that assigns a probability to that die. And that probability is internal to me. It's my probability. And the fact that we use this uh, one six, uh, this multinomial uh, distribution to model the die is just a consensus among us because we're all using internally the same propensity to bet when we see a fair-sided die, a fair, a fair die. So I think that's a yes. So, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm done with the, it's, it's really beautiful. It, uh, it uh, gives us all we, all we wanted because it gives us a, a justification, coherence, coherence being the, the axioms on this uh, preference relation. Okay, I wanna be, I want a preference relation that's transitive, otherwise I'm a fool. So I wanna be coherent and I'm coherent if and only if I'm a Bayesian because if and only if I have a utility function and a, and a distribution pi and I'm minimizing expected utility. That's beautiful, gorgeous, should be the foundation for all of statistics. And now the downsize and why it, why it cannot. The U is bounded. So away with L2 loss. There's ways to get out of this. So there's a Walker, for example, in, in, in Holland has, work, has worked on this extensively, but it gets really technical and it's hard to, the more technical you get, the less natural these axioms actually seem and the less, uh, the less hopeful you can be that everyone will, be to had, uh, will adopt them. The measure is finitely additive. So this is something that was discussed a lot in, in in the 20th century and it's not being discussed that much anymore. So you can, you can limit your actions to being, to being measurable actions and you can put a sigma algebra on the set of states, but it, there's no coherence justification for this. It's a technical justification because you want to apply the theorems of, of Lebesgue integration, but a Savage and Definiti were really angry about this and, and kept insisting that we should not, uh, you know, it's not analysis that has to tell me how I, want, how I want to bet on a die. My betting behavior in statistics should not be constrained by technical considerations of Lebesgue integration, as they would say. But, in, but on, the, uh, on the other end, I mean, if we abandon dominated convergence, uh, I mean, it's a, big, uh, it's, a, it's a big concession to make. So people who, keep using this uh, now. Like, philosophers don't mind because they're always working with finite spaces and statisticians and especially econometrists like Walker who want to remain Bayesian have found additional axioms that introduce sigma additivity at little cost. But it's never using a coherence argument. As long as you don't want to introduce, as long as you don't introduce infinite games, infinite bets, there's no real good way to see uh, sigma additivity come into the picture. So it's seen mostly as a requirement of continuity of actions. But, uh, but you, have to, you have to accept it. Um, so some people have tried to work with finitely additive probability measure and uh, LeCam in particular uh, was, was, actually, uh, was actually using them. Uh, Savage and Dubbins have written a book on stochastic processes using only finitely additive probability measures just to show that you could do it, but it would force us to reinvent basically most of our technical arsenal, which I think people are not willing to do. So that's, that's one of the, so two bad, bad news is uh, the boundedness and the sigma additivity, which you can remove at the price of being slightly non-coherent. There's another, there's actually bigger, bigger problems. My, my big problem, and it's related to questions that we had yesterday, and I'm, I'm still, I still don't really know how to solve it, but probably because I haven't read the proofs very uh, carefully enough, is the fact that all constant functions are supposed to be in our action set. Remember the example of, uh, the functions that we took for estimating a credible interval, for example, we had the indicator that theta was in the interval and we had the width of the interval. 
right? Because we wanted to be able to say, I'm, I'm happy because my interval contains theta, and I want a small credible region because that's, that's what I want to give to my biologist or my physicist. I need all constant functions to be in there. That means that I need, I need to be able to, uh, to give a preference between, uh, between an action that actually corresponds to an I and the action that, uh, the action that uh, always contains theta, but uh, that corresponds to an interval of width zero. And I need to give you a preference between these things. I have no idea, this, this, the, the second action is a constant action that doesn't represent any behavior by the statistician. It's an idealized action that, that I would not know how to interpret. But I have to rank all these constant actions, and I have to explain how I rank actual actions with respect to these constant actions that don't mean anything. And, and it's, it's a bit too much to ask, I think. It's, uh, it's something that I don't want to do naturally. And I don't see why I should be coherent about actions that I'm never going to be able to make. So this, uh, the fact that you have artificial comparisons, econometrists uh, have called these uh, imaginary acts but it, it makes me feel very uncomfortable. I, I see how you can apply savage to uh, you know, betting on a die, but if you want to go to any even moderately complex statistical experiment and describe it, then constant actions don't, usually don't make sense. Um, there's another, another thing that's, that's, that's also bothering is that the, Actually, one of the axioms of savage forces, the state space to be uh, um, non-enumerable, uh, non-countable. So you, you're not, to model a die, you have to come up with the product of, a, of R times uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, six. But you cannot have a state space that's, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's also like not so natural. It's in, makes you feel that there's technical axioms in there that somehow take you too far. It's not as, as simple as it could be, or as it should be. But the, um, the, big, the big one to me is this, uh, I don't know how to compare constant actions to, to actual actions. And I don't know why I should be coherent when I compare things that, I'm, that, I, that I was not even considering. Uh, yes, the que yesterday there were questions. I think uh, Judith and Andy asked questions about state dependence on the, of the utility. This is also where you can ask these questions. So obviously, Savage's theorem does not allow you a lot of state dependence because otherwise you could do important sample. You could do important sampling. Say if you uh, if you take uh, S to follow a, a Q, and you change your utility to uh, pi of S divided by Q of S, U of A S, then you have the same betting behavior. You have the same uh, preference relation, right? And that's forbidden by Savage's uh, axioms, and that's something that I should, uh, that I should have added in the, in the statement of the theorem. I think I have another page here. Remark, uh, in the statement of Savage, pi u, the pair of your utility function and your internal belief pi, if you want to call it a belief, the pair pi u is unique up to affine transformations of you. And there's actually two technical axioms that are there to help you disentangle the u and the pi, and to fix one of them here, the pi, and then the u is, on, is fixed up to affine transformations. So if you accept these two axioms, you're supposed to be, it's, this is, this is, oops, sorry, 
this is supposed to be forbidden, right? Because this is not an affine transformation of, of your utility. So if you accept these axioms, you're not supposed to be able to introduce state dependence. But then, is any state dependence forbidden? Or could we have some mild state dependence, like yesterday we were discussing? Remember, we wanted to have, a, say, a relative error loss. We wanted to have a loss here that was theta minus theta hat divided by, say, the value of theta, or squared, or not squared. Is this allowed? I, 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 I don't know, honestly. I, I have checked uh, yesterday, but I didn't have enough time to uh, go down to the axioms and see which one actually prevented this or, or didn't. But at least complete freedom about state dependence is not allowed. But again, it's very technical, and there's, there's actually papers. There's a list of papers by Kadan, Skirvish, and Seidenfeld that examine actually under what conditions different axiom systems are actually state independent. And, and seeing this from Savage's book is not easy, again, because lots of texts, and, and, and it's not very mathematized. So I think uh, there's need for people to write proofs, clean and simple proofs. There's actually a clean proof uh, by Fishburne, 1970. But it's, it's quite long and technical. It's not simple enough. It's not the kind of proofs that you can you know, follow and see where it leads you. It's the kind of proof, it's a logical proof that's easy to go from line one to line two. It's because every argument is, is, uh, is uh, quite simple, but uh, it's then 20 pages of logic and, and you kind of lose the focus of, of where is state dependence actually treated and then where, what kind of freedom do I, do I have. I think a sign that maybe this is not possible is that even in the, between the 70s and the 90s, when people were writing statistics textbooks that were based on axiomatics, they didn't use Savage, Savage's axioms. They always cite Savage's axioms as you know, the crowning glory of statistical decision theory, but then when it comes to stating the axioms that they're gonna use in the book, they use another set of axioms. So I'm, I'm not sure that how far you can go. Who doesn't have battery? I'm not sure how far you can go applying Savage's axioms straight to statistical problems. Unless you really want to state your preference between uh, imaginary actions. And, and personally, that's something that I feel uncomfortable with as much as I like this, uh, this axiom system. All right. But still, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a beautiful result. I was really uncomfortable when, 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 during my studies, I was always uncomfortable when people, when the teacher would go from, oh, we study this pack of cards, or we study this, uh, this situation with a die, and uh, prove that this. And in order to prove that this, you needed to associate the physical situation of playing with cards with a mathematical model using, you know, Kolmogorov probability. And this step has always been a bit mysterious to me. Like, uh, do we do this because we assume that there's some inherent probabilistic constant in nature or in the fact that we play cards or that we throw a die? And then I've always felt uncomfortable and reading about Savage's results, like it really, it reverts completely the, the viewpoint and I feel it was very philosophically nourishing. It's uh, the fact that it gives you an operational characterization of the probability that you assign to objects, I think is, uh, is really interesting. Oh, last remark that I wanna do. Remember, I had defined this conditional preference. Well, this conditional preference is the preference that comes from the same utility function, but from conditioning the, your beliefs to T in the sense of uh, you know, regular conditioning, taking a pi of S 
cap t divided by uh, pi t. So that's also a beauty of Savage's, of Savage's theorem. He, like, because of this sure thing principle, you have a definition of conditional preference. And once you have your behavior fixed by this pi and u, this uh, measure pi and this utility u, then conditional on t, if you, if you like this, uh, is the definition of conditional preference, then this definition is actually compatible with the uh, utility and the uh, conditional of pi given t. It's very tempting to use this uh, it's very tempting to use this uh, conditional preference to then make choices once you see data. So uh, I learned something about the system. This is in my state t. Then it's very tempting to use this uh, conditional to make decisions. And this is what we do as Bayesians, right? We condition on what is seen. And we say, so I, I wanted to make decisions with my pi and my u. And all of a sudden, I learn about this. Uh, new piece of data, then I'm going to condition on it, and I'm going to use this new posterior to make my choices. And Savage argues that this is built in his theorem that you should use this. But uh, actually, now I'm convinced it's not. It's only tempting. It's only natural. So what I've shown you is a natural definition of a conditional preference. And then all we can say is that mathematically, this is equivalent to using this conditional. But there's nothing in Savage's axioms that forces you to update your beliefs using conditioning. There's no coherence argument that forces you to do this. There's been a wealth of such coherence arguments that have been advanced by philosophers after Savage's work. But it's not in Savage. Savage doesn't prove that you should condition. Savage proves that you should have a big pi and a, and a u. And that's it. Yes? What does it mean to say that the trip yes. is not good enough? No, no, no. So you can give a definition to, you can still define the condition, the, this conditional. Uh, you can still define the pi of uh, s given t. I should not define it by s, maybe a given t as pi of a cap t divided by pi of t. And then this is also a finitely additive measure, and you can also integrate with respect to it as long as you integrate bounded functions, and, and you're fine. So it's the definition that you would expect in that case. But all that Savage proves is that his framework is consistent with you know, using conditioning, and that is condi what is defined as a conditional preference is, is uh, mathematically equivalent to conditioning your pi and acting using the conditioned pi. But there's no dynamic coherence argument in the Book of Savage. There's been several that have been advanced afterwards, but all of them have flows as well. It requires playing against an adversary that knows a bit too much about your pi. It's, uh, if you want to justify conditioning, and again, the, uh, don't be puzzled by the fact that we call it conditioning. The fact that we call you know, measures, with prob measures that add up to one probability measures and that we call conditioning conditioning is a, is a lure. It's a, it's a trap. We should call it you know, putting a bar and Kolmogorov measure that adds up to one. And then we, should be, we would be free of, of interpreting them as, as what we actually inherently think is probability. Anyway, those are a couple of the pluses and minuses of Savage's axioms. And again, I don't think they give you a, they're not ready to be applied to statistics. They were more a, a huge stepping stone in decision theory. And people came up with better versions of better axiom systems that are more suited to statistics, but all of them have flows. All of them don't cover important cases that we believe should be in textbooks of statistics. So I haven't found the, the axiomatic system that I would use as chapter one of a book, for example, yet. And a sign that people have stopped looking is that if you look at modern textbooks, so post-1990, they don't really talk about axiomatic systems anymore. So no, no books like De Groot or Cadain or 
And see, yes, there's the, so Judith has sent me a new book by Cadet in 2020. He still has the axioms, uh, but no, no statistics textbook that is meant to be put in the hands of someone who is going to apply statistics is going to have axiomatic systems post-1990. Yeah. It's constructive from your preference. So can you? Uh, it, it, every, every u and pi give you a coherent, give you a coherent binary relation, right? And savage then doesn't give you a, doesn't give you a way to choose u and pi. He says, uh, just pick a coherent one, and that's the only thing I can constrain. Then you can come up with additional requirements. Say, I want to have good frequentist guarantees, so this will give me, uh, this will restrict maybe my choices of u's and pi's. But, uh, but then it's up to us to decide what additional criteria we want to put on top of this uh, coherence. Coherence alone just uh, vouches for any u and pi, even the craziest ones. At least you cannot be accused of not being coherent as long as you use a u and a pi. But yeah, I don't think it's, it's easy to get some insight on which would be a good one or a bad one because there's not even a definition. It's not even easy to specify what good and bad would be in that case. All right. Okay. Yeah, something that, uh, something that you also see if, if you were seeing the same talk given, say, by Michael Jordan, we discussed the fact that there's a, there's a lecture he gave, like in 2009, on are you a frequentist or a Bayesian. I was at that summer school, and then I've also taken inspiration from this lecture for this, this one. Uh, but uh, Jordan uses Definitis theorem a lot in justifying, in justifying his, uh, his uh, keenness for Bayesian statistics. And the fact is, once you've accepted savage and you know you need a u and a pi, one way to constrain your choice of pi is to actually use Definitis theorem. So I need to put a distribution pi over states. What, what constraint can I put on my pi? Well, if I at least want to assume that there's some symmetry in my states in the sense that I assume them to be exchangeable, okay, I assume that my sequence of states that so if my states include uh, x1, x2, blah, 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 I assume that uh, uh, if I assume that my states are exchangeable in the sense of this second line, so the distribution of uh, x1, uh, any finite length uh, sequence of uh, x1, xn is independent, is invariant to permutations, then we know by definitive theorem that there exists a probability distribution mu on the set of probability measures p of x, such that conditionally on that mu, the, 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 the x1, xn are iid. So this gives, me, this gives me a license if you want to use parametric models, because it tells me, OK, if your data are exchangeable, then there necessarily exists a prior such that your data are equivalently described by drawing your theta from this prior and then drawing your data iid conditionally on that prior. So to a subjective Bayesian, once you accept a representation theorem like Savage's and you want to constrain further your choice of pi, one thing that you could call is for a structural assumption like I want to, so I need to put a distribution over my data. I will at least assume that my data is, are exchangeable. And if you do so, then you know that there's a conditionally IID structure behind your data. So you know that there is a prior somewhere, even if you describe it quite, even if it's described quite abstractly here, there is a prior such that if, 
such, my, such that my data are described by being conditionally IID given that prior. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So there is a pair prior likelihood. So my, I can use the conditionally IID model and put a prior. And uh, if I, uh, if I uh, move across all priors and likelihood, I will have, uh, I will have depleted all uh, exchangeable distributions. So in a way, that's also, you can also see the Finitis theorem. If you abide by the subjectivist viewpoint, you can see it as a license to use parametric models and priors in, uh, in Bayesian stance. So that's one way to constrain your prior. It's not in savage, but it's, it's not adding too much of a, of a, it's a small, it's a small thing to add because it's a small structural assumption. Uh, one one uh, way to see this definitive theorem in action in a subjectivist uh, area of statistics is, is non-parametric base. Um, so you might know the Chinese restaurant process, uh, also known as the blackwell mcqueen urn scheme. <coughs> this is, a, so I gave you a hint. Do you know whether this guy is Blackwell or McQueen? So this is uh, David Blackwell. Oops. So the Black Black Blackwell McQueen Earn scheme describes uh, cluster assignments, uh, or equivalently, say so I'm going to describe the Earn scheme, and then I'm going to show you why why we think about this about in terms of cluster assignments. So start with a big urn, a big bag that contains a single black ball with some weight alpha, and then you repeatedly draw a ball from the urn proportionally to its weight. Uh, if the ball is black, so you're bound to draw the black ball first. If the ball is black, you return it to the urn with another ball of weight one, but the, this new ball, you sample a new color, and you have some distribution H over colors that you sample from. And you put the new color, the new colored ball in the bag, back with the black ball. If the ball is colored, then you return it, you, you reinforce that color. So you take another ball of the same color and you add it to the, to the urn. So as long as you draw a color a lot, you will add new balls of that color. You will reinforce that behavior. Okay? And then you denote by x1, x2, blah, 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 the, the color of the ball added. So it's the sequence of the colors of the balls that you added. Okay? So let's say, uh, you can think of this as cluster assignments because you can imagine that uh, the, the balls are new data points that arrive and the color of the ball is a cluster assignment. And you tend to assign points to clusters that already have a lot of points assigned to it. Because if you want to, whenever you have a new ball, the way you assign it, uh, the way a new data point, the way you assign it to a cluster is by drawing a ball from the urn, and you tend to draw balls that uh, have been drawn a lot already. So you tend to reinforce clusters that are already existing. So this blackwell mcqueen urn scheme gives you a sequence x1, x2. Uh, it's a sequence, so theorem, blackwell, mcqueen. I didn't find a picture of mcqueen, actually. Uh, I mean, I, I found a lot of pictures of people called McQueens, obviously, but I uh, couldn't identify which one was the statistician. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, so x1, etc., x1, x2 is exchangeable. And uh, It's a definite measure. So I will go back to the previous slide to uh, remind you what the definite measure, but the mixing measure in the conditionally IID um, setup is the Dirichlet process with parameter alpha. Alpha was the weight of the black ball initially, and with base measure H the measure with which you draw the new colors. 
So it's one way to see the Dirichlet process arise. In a subjectivist uh, setting, you accept savage, then you accept definity that constrains your pi, and uh, you decide that you want to study a cluster assignment and that you're happy with this way of describing a cluster assignment, this blackwell macrino and scheme, then you can use definite, then you're actually being a Bayesian and you have a mixing measure that is, defin that is a Dirichlet process. So that's the, that's the mixing measure, that's the mu. Okay, so pros and cons of the subjectivist viewpoint. These, these axiomatic derivations are powerful. They shed light on what coherence requires. And all of them, not, not only savage, but all of these uh, axiomatic derivations they end up with some kind of subjective expected utility. You have a whole literature that is also concerned with uh, removing axioms like transitivity or weakening the sure thing principle. Usually you end up with something that is not an additive measure. You end up with subadditive measures. You have all theories of, of generalized subjective expected utility. But usually you end up with a principle like this. And if, if you're transitive and you're willing, to, you're willing to abide by some form of sure thing principle, you always end up with expected utility as we know it, with some restrictions on the u and pi. Uh, all, of these, all of these systems have some bit that is difficult to swallow. None of them is really uh, ready to be put in the textbook. And uh, if you're a subjectivist, your prior should be elicited by other structural considerations like Definitis Theorem and, uh, and the example of the blackwell macquarie scheme. Or, and, and they should all be bona fide priority distributions, or they should be elicited by expert knowledge. So you should just you know, talk with the expert until you come up with a reasonable assignment of the prior. This is something that is not so hard to do, actually. In whenever you're dealing with an important scientific application in physics or biology, like the, the, the expert always has something to do to set his prior. And not in high dimensions. Not in high dimensions. So that's a, that's a problem. True. But uh, yeah, so the experiments I've been working on in, in small dimensions, at least for the parameters of interest, if you're working on a physical experiments and you want to infer, the parameters that you want to infer are, are in, in say particle physics, they're usually, uh, there's usually a small number of parameters that you care about, maybe 10. Like if you're trying to infer the mass of the Higgs boson, there's maybe 10 parameters that interest you and the rest are thousands of nuisance parameters that you need to integrate on. But finding the priors on the important parameters are, is, usually, uh, is usually easy for, for physicists because they have all kind of background knowledge on these parameters that, you, that they are actually happy to put in the model. Uh, representation theorems can help you design the joint distribution. I've given you a general reference. Orbans and Roy are, are big uh, subjectivists in machine learning, and then they give you a list of uh, exchangeable of representation theorems like the Finetti's over exchangeable structures, but there, there's arrays, arrays, matrices, graphs. Uh, and I, I quite like the fact that uh, Bayesian non-parametrics at least has revived the subjectivist viewpoint in, in machine learning, at least on whenever you're using them like uh, Dirichlet process mixture, Dirichlet process mixtures, or, or you're using arguments like, uh, like the one that I showed you on the definity mixing measure. All right, I should hurry up actually. Is it, it's 10.20? All right, okay, so let's uh, hurry up and at least finish the why. The how, I, I placed it last because the how, you're already having a lot of talks about the how being Bayesian during this week. Uh, half of the talks about how to be Bayesian like uh, and there's posters on how to be Bayesian. There was even one variational poster yesterday, or two variational posters. I was happy because I didn't see a lot of variational inference in the, in the talks. Um, but so let's finish on the why. OK, third way to be a Bayesian. You like coherence and you like consensus. You want to be objective. You want to be an objective Bayesian. You want to choose a prior that will make everyone happy. Uh, there's been a line of research on this as well. I don't think it's as popular as it, as it used to be. Um, because it also has flows. Uh, one, 
one uh, way that has made it to textbooks is Jeffrey's non-informative priors. So if you're working, say, in an inference setting, you could uh, decide to put the prior on theta that is proportional to the square root. Let me assume that theta is one dimensional. The square root of the Fisher information. Uh, where i of theta is defined as the expectation of the square root of the, of the score. So it's uh, d over d theta of log of p of x given theta squared. And you take this expectation here with uh, respect to x given theta. So if you do this, then uh, if you transform your theta, if you do some parametric transformation, that's a C1 diffeomorphism, then you'll end up with a prior over psi that is square root of i of psi by construction. So it's a way to be, uh, it's a way for, to set up a prior that is inviolent to reparameterization. So it makes, it makes you feel good that your prior doesn't depend on, a, on the prop or a particular unit in which you measure the physical quantity, for example. Um, if you, for a, a location parameter, it actually always gives you a flat prior. For a scale parameter, so if your likelihood is expressed as P of X minus mu divided by sigma, it gives you one over sigma. The both, of the, both of these are improper priors. They are not proper probability distributions. They don't integrate to one. But still, usually when you use them as priors, they give you a valid posterior distribution. So people have been, so objective Bayesians have been, uh, have been saying that this is okay to manipulate this posterior distribution as long since it's a bona fide probability distribution, even if it comes from a prior that is dubious. The problem is you cannot you're not able to use this prior as, you know, uh, describing how you were behaving in comparing actions before you see data. Is, this is, it doesn't correspond to a coherent betting behavior and improper prior, at least not under Savage's axioms. Um, you can also run into other trouble when you're doing model comparison with improper priors, but, uh, but uh, you might be willing to accept these. One big caveat is that you're obviously violating the likelihood principle because of this. You're taking an expectation over x given theta. So you cannot, you're gonna introduce here x's for which you don't have the, for which you don't have the proportionality of the likelihood. So you cannot be you cannot be both a user of Jeffrey pri Jeffrey's priors and a, and the likelihood principle abiding Bayesian, for example. Uh, another viewpoint that's possible is because you want to be a good Valdian frequentist, and I think we're going to be we're going to see. I think Elizabeth is going to give a talk in this uh, in in this vein. We've seen a lot of talks yesterday of uh, we've seen posters yesterday about. Uh, trying to prove that you can uh, come up with estimators that have good minimax rates um, by going through empirical base and actually uh, stating frequentist probability, frequentist guarantees about, uh, about uh, Bayesian estimates. Uh, so what slide do I wanna show on this viewpoint? Yes, yeah, so you can be, you can be a good frequentist by being a Bayesian, and there are several arguments in favor of this. One argument is uh, a family of theorems called complete class theorems. So this one is from the textbook by Berger. If you have enough conditions, say your loss has to be continuous in the, in the estimator, and you want to also have a continuous function of theta once you, of theta hat, sorry, the second bullet should also be theta hat once you integrate it, then for any estimator theta tilde, there exists a corresponding prior and a base estimator. 
uh, that the, 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 the what did I write? Is this a prime? Blah 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 blah. Should probably at least put a put a should probably put this here. Otherwise, like for any estimator, you're going to be able to do better. Um, basically, the the only admissible estimators are the Bayes estimators. This is what this theorem says: is like uh, if you accept these conditions first, and you have an estimator uh, theta tilde, any estimator, I should be able to come up with a Bayesian estimator that will be smaller in terms of uh, that will have a smaller Valdian risk. Right, and smaller in the in the large sense. So the only admissible uh, the only admissible estimators, if you assume the if you if you're if you're okay with these assumptions, the only admissible estimators are Bayes estimators. So in this sense, this says that if you want to be a good Valdian frequentist, you should be a Bayesian, and it's the only way to be a good Valdian frequentist. Any estimator that you come up with, say ridge regression, is actually bound to be a Bayesian estimator in disguise. This is what we saw by, by deriving the ridge regression estimator as a Bayesian estimator. But of course, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you how to find a good prior. It doesn't tell you how to find a minimax uh, estimator. And usually, minimax estimators will, consider, will correspond to priors that are very that are like the least favorable priors, and there's a whole business in designing least favorable priors, but it's usually very ad hoc. There's no general theorem that will tell you, if you want to be, um, if you want a minimax estimator for your problem under these general conditions, this is the prior that you should use. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem that's very, uh, it, it's very, it's been very problem dependent. Okay. So my uh, yeah, last bullet is about uh, Efron's book. So it's a, he's written a book that's quite good on, on empirical base in 2012. OK, another, uh, another, another example of how you can be a good, uh, a good frequentist, a good Valdian frequentist by being a Bayesian is the sparse Bayesian regression framework. So do you know about the lasso? Who knows about the lasso? Yeah, okay, everyone knows about the lasso. Uh, so people have been trying to come up with a Bayesian version of the lasso. The first thing you might want to do is my first bullet here in the first box is the, to consider a prior on theta that's uh, Laplace. It's the Laplace priors. Five minutes, okay. So exponential minus lambda times the, the one norm of theta. Uh, the map. The maximum of this posterior is, by definition, the lasso. But the posterior is not sparse. It has no reason to, to put mass on sparse models. So there's been a whole uh, area of research in Bayesian stats about trying to find a Bayesian equivalent to the lasso. Uh, spike and slab priors have been proposed, for example, putting some mass on zero. For, uh, so you should see this prior as p of theta i given w. Uh, so it's the every component of theta, we put a prior like this on every component of theta, independently conditional on W. Uh, so this prior is uh, separated. It's a mixture between a delta zero and some some measure Q that you have to that you have to define. That would actually correspond to a posterior that puts mass on sparse models. But a more recent uh, a more recent uh, proposal has been the Holzschuh prior. Um, it's a hierarchical model where you assume the components theta j of theta to be Gaussian, but they're Gaussian conditional on lambda j and tau. There's an, indi there's an individual scale lambda j, uh, and I didn't give you a prior on this, but uh, I don't remember what the, whoops, wrong one. I don't remember what the prior and the lambda j's are, but the prior and the two on the global scale is a half Cauchy, so it's a very fat-tailed prior, and it has a big singularity at zero. So it will tell you to really set all your tetas to zero unless 
it's really signal unless, unless it's really a large component, in which case the tails of, of, the, of the Cauchy are quite flat. So it will not shrink. It will not have this tendency that the lasso has to shrink big components. So it's uh, from a... From a modeling point of view, even from a subjectivist point of view, it's quite a, it's quite a natural prior. And the good thing is, you can actually show, that's a theorem of van der Pass, Klein and van der Waart. Uh, I discovered all this as at BNP in Oxford. If, if some of you guys were at BNP in Oxford, I, it was really, really nice. So the, um, there's way, under some condition on the size of the support of the theta, and if you actually know the size of the support of the theta, then the, what I call G star of the data set, it's actually the posterior mean of the, of the whole shoe uh, prior. So it's the posterior, is the whole shoe posterior mean. Uh, this is a minimax estimator. So the rate at which, and there should be a squared here. This rate is actually the best rate you can hope for. And they have ways to, if you don't know the size of the support, so if you don't know the size of the zero norm of theta, uh, they have empirical base estimate that lets you uh, attain the same rate, called the minimax rate. It's the best worst case rate you can hope for. So again, by being a Bayesian, like Carvalho, they wanted to be good subjective Bayesians, but by being good subjective Bayesians, they actually found the prior that uh, led to minimax rates so to being a good Valdian frequentist. Uh, another, uh, so I will not talk too much about it because Benjamin Gage will talk about it, but I wanted to mention it. Another way of being a good Valdian frequentist, at least in machine learning, is to be a pack learner. So remember a pack bound, I told you about it, is the type of bounds that you find in the first block, the type of bounds that are very popular in uh, statistical learning. Uh, you want to guarantee that your uh, generalization loss is small with large probability over your data set. One way to obtain such back, back, back bounds is to actually use uh, bounds in the spirit of uh, what I've written here, McAllister's bound. Uh, it's basically a way to look at this pink term here. This is the generalization error of a classifier. And then I integrate this, so I build an aggregate classifier using a distribution over Q. So I, if I integrate this uh, generalization error, I can actually bound this by the, the same expectation under some distribution Q of my empirical error, plus some term that measures the mismatch between Q and any other arbitrary distribution P over classifiers. So now this suggests taking the Q, a measure on classifiers, that actually minimizes this right-hand side bound. And this will look like a posterior, but it's, it's not going to be a posterior in the sense that it's not obtained by conditioning. It's just going to be a distribution over classifiers that depend on your data. But you can actually show that this will lead to, uh, to good pack bounds. So it's another way of being a good frequentist by manipulating Bayesian-like tools but this time you do not abide by subjective base, for example. You do not, at least definitely, you do not update your uh, distributions by conditioning. Uh, and I'm almost done, so two slides left. I want to... I want to conclude, so first, first conclusion slide is the fact that uh, most textbooks that you will find today on Bayesian statistics or Bayesian machine learning are hybrid. So they do not choose any of these viewpoints that I've shown you today, which I think is also why you get questions from students like, uh, am I allowed to do this with my prior? Because as long as you haven't chosen why you want to, why you want to do subjective expected utility, there's no way to give a clear answer to that question. Um, but if you look at, for example, Christian Robert's book in 2007, is he, is he here? Or is he still swimming? In the... so, but I, but I, hope, uh, I hope to discuss this with him during the conference. So, so I've, 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 I've looked at all the textbooks that I knew in Bayesian stats, and I've tried to put the textbooks in a, in a box in my big table of, uh, you know, what Bayesian are you? 
And you had a lot of subjective Bayesians pre-1990, but post-1990, you, you, you see a lot of hybrid views. So for example, I could paraphrase Christian's view by saying, I want to, you know, I know about Val decision, Val's decision set, setting. That's the starting point. I want to add integration with respect to a prior, okay? And sometimes it gives me good frequentist properties. It satisfies the likelihood principle when priors do not depend on data. So I like this Bayesian viewpoint because it's grounded in decision theory. When I, when I don't want to use the data in my priors, it satisfies the likelihood principle, which I find interesting but not compelling to the point that I should only use this. Um, this Bayesian viewpoint, it's tempting to interpret it as you know, beliefs are represented by probabilities. I should, I should communicate my uncertainty by sharing my belief. So this is all subjective, subjective base. It's updated using, by ba using Bayes' rule. So Bayes' rule is natural. So same kind of argument than in, Sa than in Savage. Bayes' rule is a natural way of updating my, uh, my, uh, my beliefs. Um, I like this Bayesian framework because it's easy to communicate about your uncertainty. You simply give your posterior. If you want to make a decision and you want consensus, you make sure that everyone's prior leads to the same decision. And if not, then you discuss until you reach an agreement. And alternately, you can perform some kind of prior sensitivity analysis, which is the poor man's, poor man's hierarchical model. Just show that with a reasonable set of priors, your decision would not have changed. This is what you would do in a physics paper, for example. Um, so this is, this is all the points in favor of the Bayesian viewpoint. But it's, it's all of these points are weaker than the corresponding you know, extreme viewpoints. I want to abide by the likelihood principle. It's I like the Bayesian framework because it has all of these. But uh, if you choose one of these bullets and you take it seriously, then you have to, you have to uh, abandon some of the other bullets. But somehow, like, the, the way books are written today is more, OK, we like the fact that these, all these supporting arguments, and sometimes I will be one school of Bayesians. Sometimes I will actually adhere to another school, and that's fine. And, and old books are like this. So what kind of Bayesian are you? So that's uh, something that I'm happy to discuss during the, the rest of the week. So are you even a Bayesian? And what kind of Bayesian are you? But to the point, to the, to the extent that you can be a frequentist by being a Bayesian, I think most of us would, would be to some level Bayesians. Um, I've only scratched the surface of these foundations. There are there's other, view, other viewpoints. The, the field is moving, although not, not as fast as it used to be. But you can look at, the, at Deb Mayo's book. Deborah Mayo is one of the few remaining frequentist philosophers, I think. It's, it's really hard to be a frequentist among philosophers of knowledge. And uh, Mayo is one of the, one of the chief frequentists. Um, well, yeah, posterior expected utility, it's conceptually simple. It's unifying. You can treat any problem. Everything is mechanic. I really like this. Then you can discuss priors, and you can all agree on priors, or you can all check that your different priors give the same decision and, or, and try to understand it. why not if not. Many interpretations have partial philosophical support, but no interpretation actually has you know, support that's strong enough that I would actually adopt it fully if I, were write, if I were writing a book. The role of the different objects, like the likelihood, the prior, the update mechanisms, uh, they, they depend on the interpretation that you choose. Uh, many people do not care. Uh, it used to be a big topic, but uh, it's, it's not being discussed. Hybrid views have become common. So I mentioned Robert's book. You can check Gelman's book. Uh, he has also a very practical approach, defining Bayesian statistics as a kind of cycle where you fit, and then you evaluate your fit, and you change your model. As if you describe statistics like this, it's, uh, I think it's very valuable because you quickly arrive to applications, but it means that you completely go out of a framework like subjective base, where you're not allowed to check the, the validity, the frequentist validity of your model, for example. But arguably, this is a weakness of, of uh, Savage. I like the fact that in ML, you see uh, subjective viewpoints come back, especially in Bayesian non-parametrics. I like the fact that we have this new way of thinking of being a good Bayesian by being a frequentist uh, using for, as pack Bayes. 
And uh, I, yes, if you're interested in subjective Bayes, I, I recommend this book. It's a, it's a great entry point. And I think that's all. I will give my annotated slides probably to the, to the organizers if they have somewhere to put them. And there's a, I've put plenty of references. And then you'll have my annotations if, if, if they're not too confusing. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>